Hey everyone, Mr. Harvey here. Let's continue our lecture and we are on chapter 11 now and this is kind of the second part of the French Revolution and we are talking about Napoleon and Napoleon's empire. So uh, remember ladies and gentlemen, this is the last kind of phase of the revolution. Uh, remember we have six phases of the revolution. Let's kind of review them a little bit. All right, we have that, that National Assembly, Legislative Assembly, the Convention ladies and gentlemen, we have the Directory, the Consulate, and then we are focusing today on Napoleon's empire. We talked a little about Napoleon yesterday, ladies and gentlemen, just about his rise to power, some of the domestic reforms, his Napoleonic code, uh, some of the changes uh, uh, that he's going to be making, ladies and gentlemen. But today I really want to focus on the empire and uh, some of the Napoleonic wars and the conflicts, uh, 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 European conflicts that we're going to be seeing with Napoleon. Okay, so let's get started, ladies and gentlemen. So uh, Napoleon's going to seize upon a bomb attack uh, and make himself emperor. This is going to be actually really similar, ladies and gentlemen, to what... Um, uh, Hitler will be doing and when I talk about Napoleon ladies and gentlemen I also want you remember I want you to keep in mind uh, the dictators that we're going to be seeing um, uh, in the 20th century especially during uh, the 1930s with uh, Nazi Germany uh, fascist Italy and uh, communist uh, the communist Soviet Union uh, but uh, when you think of Napoleon I definitely want to uh, you to be thinking about Hitler because we're going to see Napoleon and Hitler uh, use a lot of the same tactics to gain power uh, and make a lot some of the uh, same mistakes uh, when it comes to their European conflicts. But Napoleon is going to seize upon a bomb, pack, a bomb attack to make himself emperor. It's going to be similar to what Hitler is going to be doing with the uh, Reichstag fire when he makes himself um, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the dictator of uh, the chancellor of Nazi Germany. Okay, uh, we're going to see another constitution uh, in France to make him uh, the hereditary emperor of France. And this is, you know, this is kind of the big irony of the French Revolution is we had the hereditary monarch uh, with the Bourbon family, and now, you, uh, you know, later on the revolution in the early 1800s, they have a, a hereditary uh, military dictator, now emperor. Um, so it's, it's it, the, the, you know, the question that we're kind of asking ourselves is, what did France achieve by this? And we can see, and we talked yesterday about the, the uh, hypocrisy of Napoleon towards the revolution, how he was revolutionary and how he was not revolutionary. Um, so this is yet something... Uh, another thing that does not make Napoleon very revolutionary is that he has now made himself emperor hereditary, a hereditary emperor of France. Okay, he's going to crown himself in uh, uh, Notre Dame Cathedral, um, and this, you know, he he, he did this in uh, in the hopes to preempt uh, royalists who had planned to return the Bourbon to the throne. Um, you know, he believed an empire was necessary for France to maintain and expand its influence. Um, and Napoleon is also going to view himself um, as a liberator. Uh, to free you know, some of the foreign peoples uh, from absolute rulers who oppress them. Um, but again, th there will be an irony with this because Napoleon is going to turn around and, and oppress some of those other peoples. Um, so, uh, but that, that's definitely a motive for Napoleon uh, within this. And we're going to see, and when, when you think about Napoleon's uh, empire and his wars, I also want you to be thinking about heat, about the spread of the revolution. Remember that quote, right? When France sneezes, the rest of Europe is going to catch that cold. All right, we're going to see Napoleon as his armies march throughout Europe, Spain, uh, in the Germanic lands, Prussia, Austria, Russia. He's going to be spreading the revolution throughout Europe. Those soldiers who are who are um, revolutionaries, okay, who believe in the revolution, are going to be spreading those ideas throughout Europe. So we'll be thinking about that. And here's a very famous picture of uh, an, a portrait of Napoleon on the throne. All right, let's move on. Okay, so. Uh, Napoleon uh, in, his em uh, in his empire is going to conquer most of Europe during his reign, very similar to Hitler, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, but there's a huge effect of Napoleon's empire in that he is going to unleash the entity of nationalism, liberalism as well throughout Europe. Okay, And so uh, we'll talk about what nationalism and uh, liberalism, we'll be talking about those two uh, isms uh, a little bit more in chapter 12 and a little bit throughout this uh, lecture and, uh, and uh, some of the other lectures. Um, but briefly... Uh, you know, as Napoleon conquers countries and conquers areas, and these areas are ruled by the French, you're going to start to see in, for example, the best example in Italy, uh, in Germany especially, uh, nationalism. These people who are being oppressed by the French, who are being ruled by the French, um, are going to want their own country. And so we're going to see nationalism, the idea of wanting to unite around a country, around a common language, culture, and we'll be talking more about that later in chapter 12. But that that I, that entity of nationalism is definitely going to be going to be an effect of Napoleon, and we're going to see that people are going to want their own country. We, and we'll start to see that. All right, 
Uh, and this is definitely going to be uh, prominent as nations are going to seek independence from his empire. And we're going to see that in Germany, Italy, and, and throughout Europe. All right. Uh, during his reign, Napoleon's most powerful weapon, ladies and gentlemen, is going to be that Le'Veon mass, that, that military mobilization of France. He's going to be able to, you know, put half a million, a million uh, uh, men under arms at one time. He can risk losing 100,000 troops in battle, endure heavy losses. Um, and it, it was due to his um, organization, that uh, that conscription, that levy on mass that we saw in uh, the French Revolution, in the earlier phases of the French Revolution, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, but we're going to see Napoleon uh, make some serious mistakes, um, and his own self-inflicted mistakes are going to be um, his downfall. And much like Hitler, we're going to be seeing when, I, when we get into World War II. Um, but Napoleon's going to be able to put these, just these mega armies on the, uh, on the, uh, Battlefield, and that's going to also allow him to fight multiple nations at once. He's going to be able to fight uh, Austria, Russia, Prussia, England at the same time, and be able to beat them. All right, and it's because of this this organization and this mass conscription, um, uh, this Le'Veon mass in France, ladies and gentlemen. All right, uh, and we're going to see Napoleon uh, create the largest empire in Europe since Roman times. I mean, he is going to be very successful um, until he isn't. Uh, but he's going to be very successful, and his empire will be uh, vast. All right, and this kind of shows that, ladies and gentlemen. I want to talk a little bit about that, uh, this empire, um, through this uh, through this image. Okay, and this is kind of the height of the empire in 1812, ladies and gentlemen. But you can see, right? Th this is and these French satellites are just areas of control. Okay, and you can see fr uh, uh, French allies. He's going to force you know Prussia and Austria to be uh, to be his allies, but he's going to you know. Um, rule over parts of Spain, rule over, um, uh, you know, Italy, parts of Italy, just outright just take parts that you can see kind of in the different color of green. Um, uh, but ultimately, uh, and you can see, he's, you know, going to have Belgium, going to have the Netherlands, going to have this Confederation of the Rhine, which we'll talk about, okay? But ultimately, part of his undoing will be the invasion of Russia, which we will be talking about. Okay, but this is this is a pretty vast empire, and this really just shows the the, the the French power. And also, I want you to be thinking about this, ladies and gentlemen. As you can see, with this influence, okay, the, the French armies and Napoleon's armies marching throughout Europe, uh, you can see the 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 French Revolution, the Enlightenment, these ideas spreading. Okay, and so there's no coincidence, ladies and gentlemen, that these areas all throughout all throughout Europe, uh, we're going to see uh, the revolution spread. And we'll be seeing that especially in the in, uh, the nineteenth century, eighteen hundreds, with more revolutions. Okay, and just another picture illustrating uh, Napoleon's empire. Powerful. Napoleon was powerful. He was no joke. All right, and Europe uh, Europe was finding that out the hard way. All right, so uh, beginning in eighteen o three, ladies and gentlemen, Napoleon's going to start to engage in uh, constant warfare, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Um, France is going to expand their territory, as you saw on the map, into the Netherlands, into Belgium. Uh, France is going to uh, uh, force uh, in, uh, uh, some of the German states uh, under his control, and he's going to uh, govern these satellite states. Uh, he's going to create this Confederation of the Rhine, which we will talk about. Super important. Let's make sure we highlight the Confederation of the Rhine. This is going to be very uh, uh, instrumental towards the uh, reorganization of Germany and eventually the unification of Germany. But he's going to govern uh, Spain and Italy. And what I mean by a satellite state, ladies and gentlemen, a satellite state is that you're going France is going uh, is going to control these areas. It's not going to outright annex them in the sense that make that, you know, incorporate them into France. They're still it's still going to be Spain, but he's the France is going to be controlling Spain, you know. France if you go back if we go back to the maps uh, and you look at it, ladies and gentlemen, um, these satellites it, it just means that uh, you know, France is going to be controlling these areas. There will be some Germanic leaders, maybe you know, maybe some French leaders there. Uh, um, but France controls them. They don't right, outright annex them and incorporate them into France. Okay. Um, after military defeats, Prussia, Austria, and Russia are going to be forced to ally with him. And all the countries of this grand empire are going to be introduced to some of the main principles of the French Revolution. And it's mainly due to the soldiers. It's mainly due to the culture. It's mainly due to um, the revolution. The, these revolutionary soldiers you're going to see are just going to be uh, are, are going to be you know. Um, sources of the, the of the spread okay and allow the revolution to spread and so as napoleon's armies march throughout all of europe that's really important for us to remember we're going to see other countries be introduced to, to some, some of the main principles and main notions of the french revolution 
very important for us, okay? Um, so we see this war of the, uh, the Third Coalition. Uh, in 1803, Britain and Napoleon are going to uh, resume their hostilities. Um, Austria, Russia, and Sweden are all going to uh, join Great Britain, okay? A major, major battle that we're going to be seeing, ladies and gentlemen, is the Battle of Trafalgar, very important. And this is going to be... Um, uh, Napoleon's navy is going to be defeated by the British. Now, you know, that's no coincidence, right? We know this about um, Great Britain ever since the Spanish Armada, ladies and gentlemen. Great Britain uh, rules the ocean. And Napoleon, uh, in order to, um, uh, you know, Napoleon was hoping to be able to invade Great Britain, okay? Well, the, the, the British navy is going to uh, step in and defeat his navy. And so very similar, ladies and gentlemen, to um uh, to Hitler that we're going to be seeing in World War II is that Napoleon will not be able to cross the English Channel, okay? Uh, Great Britain is going to uh, be safe because of the British Navy. Very important. So this is going to end his hopes of invading Great Britain and showcase that naval superiority that we see that's going to last until um, the 1900s, the, the, the 20th century. Very important for us. And that's going to be a very similar thing to Hitler, ladies and gentlemen. Hitler will not be able to cross that, uh, cross that English Channel um, uh, like like Napoleon. So Napoleon's army, Napoleon would have no doubt taken out the uh, the British army. The, Britain was not known for having a, a large army, um, uh, but he simply he couldn't get there, all right, because he can't he can't cross the channel because the, the navy. And if he tries to cross the channel uh, with no navy, I mean his army will be lost. Okay, so this battle of Trafalgar is very important because it saves Great Britain. And this is just a picture of the uh, the kind of how the battle went. It was it was very revolutionary. Um, uh, um, uh, the British decided to, instead of lining up side to side and kind of having just a big uh, shootout uh, with the, um, the, uh, the uh, Napoleon's fleet, is they decided to split the fleet. They went head on to the, um, to the fleet and split them into, into different sections. And that just kind of um, evened the odds in certain, and just divided their forces. And uh, they were able to win a great victory. Very famous. And uh, when we get back to class, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I will show you Trafalgar Square. Um, that is dedicated to um, this uh, uh, this very uh, famous victory for the British. All right, um, but on the continent, um, so they lose on, on the sea. Napoleon loses on the sea, but on the continent, Napoleon d doesn't just defeat his um, uh, enemies; he humiliates them. And, uh, and Napoleon was uh, feared big time. He was a master. Um, he was just an intellectual of military tactics. Um, and he uh, was a master, and he 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 um, was just a, a brilliant strategist who um, who uh, uh, was very tough to beat on the battlefield. And uh, a very famous victory is his Battle of Austerlitz. And, and really important, ladies and gentlemen, is you don't need to memorize all this all the warfare, you know, all the famous victories. Trafalgar is definitely important for us, but you don't need to memorize all the, all that the battles and warfare. That's not going to be on the AP exam. It's just context to understanding Napoleon's uh, Napoleon wars. Okay. Uh, but the Battle of Austerlitz, really important. Napoleon's going to defeat uh, the Austrians and uh, Russian forces. Um, Napoleon, during this time, is going to be crowned the king of Italy. Um, and we're going to see Napoleon in 1806 uh, defeat the Prussians, and he will also reorganize uh, many of the Western German states into the Confederation of the Rhine. And that's important for us. We're going to be talking about that. That's, that's very important for us, this Confederation of the Rhine. We're going to see a treaty of uh, Tilsit in 1807. Prussia is going to lose half of its territory to France. Uh, Russia is going to be forced to accept uh, Napoleon's reorganization of Central and Eastern Europe and the continental system, which we will be talking about. Uh, Russia and Prussia are going to be forced to become allies to Napoleon. All right. Uh, and you can see Napoleon is exerting his influence and exerting his power over Europe, ladies and gentlemen. Now, let's talk about this continental system, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, we know that Napoleon cannot defeat the British. He can't get there. He can't get there because of Trafalgar. He cannot defeat the Navy. He can't get there. So Great Britain is still a, very much a thorn in his side. And so he is going to come up with this idea if, well, if I can't beat them militarily, okay, uh, maybe I can try to beat them economically. And so his goal with this continental system is to isolate Britain and to further his uh, mastery over Europe. And he's really trying to do this economically. Well, Napoleon's silly. He doesn't understand that Great Britain is the economic giant of uh of europe okay and they're they have the agricultural revolution has gone is going down uh the uh the industrial revolution is going down great britain is is a powerhouse economically and, and napoleon really uh makes a mistake in un underestimating that and he this this continental system will eventually fail um so 
Uh, we're going to see the uh, the Berlin decrees issued by Napoleon. It's going to forbade his allies from importing British goods. And we'll talk about why that's significant. That's going to be devastating to Prussia, devastating to Russia. Um, we're going to see uh, the order in council as a retaliation for this. And this is Great Britain's response. They're going to forbid any British allies, subjects, and neutral countries from trading um, uh, with uh, France. All right, so uh, any British allies, any of their subjects, colonies, um, areas that they have influence, and any neutral countries, including the United States, and this is actually going to be really um, uh, hurtful for the United States because uh, the United States is a neutral country, and this is eventually going to lead to the War of 1812, but you'll learn more about that next year um, in a push. Um, we're going to see Napoleon respond um, to uh, the respond with the Milan Decree, ladies and gentlemen, which is Napoleon's going to attempt to stop neutral nations from trading with Britain. And you can kind of just see them going back and forth. And you don't need to you don't need to memorize all of this, ladies and gentlemen, all these decrees. But understand that this is Napoleon waging um, economic warfare on Great Britain, and he's losing, and he he is going to lose this big time. Okay, and eventually these edi edicts are going to lead uh, the United States to declare war on Great Britain because Great Br uh, the United States wants to be able to trade with France and other countries, and Great Britain says no, nope, no nope, neutral neutral country can do that, and the United States. Um, uh, the United States is going to uh, be forced to declare war on Great Britain over this. All right, this continental system is going to be a double failure. I put failure on twice on purpose. This is a huge failure for France, and it was because Napoleon did not understand the economic might of Great Britain. Moreover, he did not understand his allies, especially Russia's reliance on Great Britain. Who's the industrial power of the world during this time, and especially in Europe? It's Great Britain and Russia. Prussia, a lot of his allies that don't have the economics, uh, the e economic, uh, um, you know, uh, capacity or the economic uh, advancement, they rely on Great Britain for a lot of manufactured goods for a lot of stuff, and um, and so by you know by not allowing by Napoleon not allowing his allies to trade with Great Britain, it's going to cripple their economy. They're going to be forced to just abandon Napoleon. Okay, uh, Great Britain's economy is going to survive. They're simply just going to increase trade with the Americas, increase trade internationally. They're going to seek new markets. Okay, uh, and other European countries are going to suffer greatly, especially in Russia and Eastern Europe, where they were dependent upon Great Britain's imports, dependent for uh, 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 coal, any iron, um, any textiles. They were really dependent upon uh, the imports of Great Britain. Great Britain is the economic power, and so. Eastern European countries now can't trade with them. It's going to cripple their economy, and they're going to be forced to uh, abandon that continental system and eventually turn against Napoleon. Let's talk about this Confederation of the Rhine, though, ladies and gentlemen. This is really important and really important um, foreshadowing for the unification of Germany, which is coming up soon. We're going to be talking about that in a couple chapters. Okay. Um, after defeating Austria and Prussia, the two Germanic, uh, you know. Uh, nations who are, you know, really influential in Central Europe. Napoleon is going to reorganize Germany, okay, and he's going to take those nearly 300 independent political entities. And remember, we've known we've known that ever since the HRE, we've known that ever since um, uh, we've been talking about, uh, 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 you know, the Germanic lands in this class is that Germany has been super divided. We've seen that uh, in the uh, in the, uh, uh, the the wars during uh, the Reformation. We saw that during the Thirty Years' War, okay. Um, and that's, remember, been kind of France's goal. Well, Napoleon is going to um, consolidate Germany and start to help unite it. And he is going to create this confederation of the Rhine. He's going to take these 300 independent political entities, these states, and make it into 15. Much more organized. Much more stable. Okay? Uh, and so now, we, and we have now a... a, a, a you know, this confederation of the Rhine, we now have 15 German states. That's minus Austria, Prussia, and Saxony, okay? Um, but, you know, many of the tiny German states are going to be abolished. The uh, Holy Roman Empire is officially going to be dissolved, and the HRE emperor will just simply call themselves the Austrian emperor. But this is important, ladies and gentlemen, because now you have a more organized Germany, right? And we're going to see OVB, uh, you know, eventually organize that completely. Otto von Bismarck completely uh, organized that into... Um, the German Empire, but this is also going to awaken German nationalism due to the uh, France's domination of the German states. The Germans are going to want uh, France to get out, and they're going to want uh, their own country. Okay, and that this idea of German nationalism, of German Germans wanting their own nation, okay, uniting around their nation, uniting around their common bonds of culture, of language. Okay, 
uh, that that's going to be really important with this Confederation of the Rhine. So the Confederation of the Rhine, ladies and gentlemen, really important. We are starting to see the uh, we are starting to see the foreshadowing of the unification of Germany. Germany is reorganized. This is Western Germany. Germany is being reorganized by Napoleon, and that will eventually help facilitate the unification of Germany. Okay, um, and like I said, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to see increasing nationalism. Um, uh, begin calls for German unification. Prussia, Prussia is going to make some very important um, uh, social, militaristic, and administrative reforms. And uh, Prussia is also going to serve as a patriotic center point for future unification. And it is Prussia with Otto von Bismarck that is going to unify uh, Germany. So we are starting to see the foreshadowing of that with the Confederation of the Rhine. Uh, we're also going to see um, uh, uh, the abolishment of serfdom. We're going to see uh, more military uh, positions based on merit, uh, more war colleges. But the big thing here, ladies and gentlemen, that we're getting at is we are getting ready for German unification. And this is Napoleon. Napoleon, by uh, by invading these areas, by, take, by taking these areas and controlling these areas, the German people want their own country. Okay? They're going to we're going to see the reorganization of the German states. It's going to make it easier for them to unite. 15 states is much easier than 300 states to unite. And so we are starting to get ready for... Germany. Okay, very important for us. Okay, we're going to also see the Peninsular War, ladies and gentlemen. In 1807, France is going to invade uh, um, the Iberian Peninsula, Spain, Portugal, uh, in order to force Portugal to abandon its alliance with Great Britain. Remember, Portugal is right next to Spain. All right, uh, and Napoleon is going to replace the Spanish king with his own brother, uh, Joseph. Now, um, you know, this is very hypocritical of Napoleon. Remember, Napoleon introduces that careers open to talent, that, that meritocracy within uh, France. However, he puts his own brother on, you know, in charge of Spain. That's not really a meritocracy. That's more of you know family connection right there. Um, so uh, Napoleon, there's another example of Napoleon being quite um, you know, uh, hypocritical to his, some of his own policies. But we're going to see a, 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 a guerrilla warfare uh, erupt in Spain, and what that means is kind of like it's 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 like street by street, you know, like urban fighting. It's not you know big armies fighting once another, but the Spanish people are going to kind of uh, uh, rise up, um, uh, you know, and and start fighting the French and killing the French. All right, um, we're going to see Britain support the Spanish rebels with the Duke of Wellington, who we're going to talk about with Waterloo, um, and uh, this is going to be a war that you know extracts a very heavy toll on uh, on the French, ladies and gentlemen. Now, Napoleon also is going to have some uh, some personal issues that we need to talk about. Um, uh, Napoleon is going to divorce his wife, Josephine, because uh, uh, she was unable to bear him uh, a child, uh, very much tidings of uh, Henry VIII, if we remember that, uh, of the Tudors. And he's going to marry uh, um, the daughter of the Austrian Empire, uh, uh, Marie-Louise. Okay. Um, and so he, he, Napoleon uh, was very, you know, was very much trying to keep his uh, line going. And so he, he was trying to have um, an heir. Now, let's talk about Russia, all right, the Russian campaign. We're going we're gonna to be, um, again, this is a, a similarity to Hitler, ladies and gentlemen, is uh, the relationship between France and Russia is going to deteriorate. And eventually Russia is going to be forced to leave the continental system. Well, Russia was very reliant upon Great Britain for imports. Um, and um, and Russia's economy was just being completely wrecked because they could not import from Great Britain, and France would not let them. All right, so eventually, um, you know, Russia's going to leave the continental system, continental system, and Napoleon is going to try to invade them. So he's going to raise an army of about six hundred thousand men. And uh, but the Russians uh, have you know kind of a tactic that they're going to be using, and this is really important for us, and this is going to be very similar. Uh, to uh, World War II and Hitler, and Hitler's going to do you know the, the same thing. He's going to invade. Uh, uh, he's going to invade um, the Soviet Union, and the Russia, the Russians are going to simply retreat and burn their land and 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 bring the French in deeper and deeper into Russia. and And this is really important for us to understand, ladies and gentlemen. Is, is uh, Russia eventually the Soviet Union? It's it's a huge area. Okay, this is this is a long ways away from Paris and France. This is a long ways away from Germany. This is a long this is a long ways away uh, from Napoleon's um, kind of like you know home base. Um, and the Russians are simply uh, sacrificing space for time because eventually the the winter will set in, and it's going to get cold. It's going to get miserable, and uh, that will bring more favorable conditions uh, for the Russians to. Uh, to fight, and so they just want to bring Napoleon in deeper and deeper and deeper into Russia, 
um, because the French really aren't equipped and they really aren't, uh, you know, ready for what the winter is going to be like. And the Russians know that. Okay. Um, an event, and uh, they even the Russians even give up Moscow. The, uh, Napoleon's going to find Moscow on fire and abandon, and he's going to be forced to retreat uh, as the winter is setting in. And you know they're going to have little supply. It's going to be tough to bring in supplies from all the way from from France, you know, across you know a long distance um, to Moscow. And so he's going to be forced to retreat as the winter is setting in um, because he was you know Napoleon, and this is going to be very much like Hitler was hoping for a quick victory. And uh, to just destroy the Russian army. And the Russian army, you know, really just kind of retreated, retreated, retreated. They did give battle a couple times. Um, but the bigger picture is, is that Napoleon's going to lose this big time. Okay, big time. And it's partly because of the Russian winter. Really important. The Russian winter is going to force the French out. It gets cold there. And we've talked about that. Okay, it gets cold. All right. Uh, and this is a devastating defeat for Napoleon, okay? Only 100,000 of his original 600,000 soldiers are going to survive. This is humiliating for him. And, and Napoleon really underestimated the Russians. And we'll see the same thing with Hitler. Hitler's going to really underestimate them um, and underestimate the winter, okay? And he, it, this is just showcasing, again, the, uh, some arrogance right here. Napoleon was quite arrogant and um, didn't think he could lose, and he lost big time. All right? And this is kind of just uh, kind of illustrating uh, what Napoleon... How Napoleon found Moscow. It was on fire. Okay, so he could not stay there. There's no food or no supplies. Okay, he couldn't feed his big army, and so they're going to be forced to go back. Okay, they're going to be forced to go back. All right, and just this illustrates the miserable retreat uh, from Moscow. And this is where you're going to start to see the Russians attack. They're going to start attacking them while they're it's cold, while they're and, and remember they don't have really heating, ladies and gentlemen. They don't have. Uh, you know, a place state, many of these soldiers are just going to simply freeze in their sleep to death. Miserable. Okay. And this is in the Russian, and they're also going to have to be worrying about uh, attacks from the Russian army. Okay. All right. Uh, uh, eventually, we're going to see Austria and Prussia ally with Russia and Britain. Uh, Napoleon is going to lose this battle of the, uh, of the nations, uh, uh, Leipzig, in October of 1813. And he's going to be forced to abdicate the throne and go into exile off of Elba in March of 1814. Okay, and Elba is uh, right off of the coast of Italy, and it's a small island. So he's going to be Napoleon is going to be forced to go into exile. All right. However, Napoleon is going to come back, and this really showed uh, a lot of the army and a lot of the military was still very much devoted um, to Napoleon. Okay, so Napoleon's going to return in uh, March of 1815, ladies and gentlemen, but he's going to be defeated at the very famous Battle of Waterloo uh, by the Duke of Wellington. Um, uh, and the Prussians, and uh, this time Napoleon is going to be sent off the coast of Africa to St. Helena, where he will die in 1821, and Napoleon uh, Napoleon is defeated finally. Napoleon is gone. Okay, so this kind of illustrates Napoleon's defeat at Waterloo, a very famous victory um, uh, where the, uh, the, the British and the Prussians will uh, defeat um, the French. Okay, and here's a picture of Napoleon on his way to exile off of St. Helena, and you can see right here, it's off the coast of Africa, small island. All right, here was a picture of Napoleon's residence on St. Helena, All right, and there's a picture of Napoleon's tomb. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we'll stop here for today, and we're going to be talking about the Congress of Vienna, the, con uh, uh, the, the Congress system, and kind of the peace uh, and, uh, and the, the effects of Napoleon and the French Revolution in the next lecture. Thank you so much.